Capitulo 4, Disturbing Facts Well, I'm fine, and how are you, Lord? William. Victoria answered trying to sound serene, but her voice a little broken by the nerves. I'm fine, William said seemingly calmly, but there was some tension in him. They both looked into each other's eyes for a moment, then both looked away, a little embarrassed. You did not introduce me to these lovely young ladies, William said, trying to break the awkward silence. Victoria introduced Nancy and Harriet, feeling a little relieved to divert attention to them. Nancy and Harriet greeted William with some timidity, even the usually indiscreet Harriet who seemed a bit intimidated by William's presence. Your friends are very beautiful, just like you, said Lord Melbourne charmingly, making Victoria blush. Thank you! exclaimed Nancy and Harriet almost like a choir. At that moment Robert approached them, seeing William as if he were seeing the Queen of England herself in person and up close, for the first time in his life. William, this is Mr. Robert Pearson, my lawyer, Victoria said courteously. It's a pleasure to meet you Mr. Pearson, William said kindly as he shook his hand. The pleasure is mine, Lord William Mayborn, a true honor, Robert replied with a certain emotion, little concealed. Please, join me in the boardroom. William told them. William guided the group to the boardroom and, as they crossed the threshold of the door, Ephraim, William's lawyer, met them. Victoria, this is Ephraim Levin, my best friend and my lawyer, the head of the Mayborn Corporation legal team, William said pleasantly. It's a pleasure, Mr. Levin, Victoria said as she shook Ephraim's hand. The pleasure is mine, Miss Walker. You can call me Ephraim. Ephraim replied gently as he watched Victoria with much curiosity, trying to figure out what was in her that had led his friend William to act so irrationally. Thank you, you can call me Victoria, Victoria said with a shy smile. William made the corresponding presentations between Ephraim and the rest of the group. Ephraim was cordial to everyone, but when he saw Robert, he made a gesture of skepticism at the sight of her second-rate lawyer. Ephraim then introduced four lawyers from his team who were accompanying him at the meeting, two women and two men, and Robert seemed intimidated to see five lawyers in elegant suits and expressions of corporate legal predators. Well, Ephraim. I'll leave you the word because it's your field, William said after they all sat around the huge boardroom table. Thank you William, well, the documents William gave Victoria were drafted by the legal team that I run and I think them contain extremely favorable conditions for Victoria, should the marriage be celebrated. I imagine Mr. Pearson will agree with me in which the conditions are unbeatable for his client, and I am willing to answer any questions or doubts," said Ephraim in a professional manner. Yes, them are certainly unbeatable conditions, as far as doubts are concerned, there are only a few points I would like to make clear," Robert replied fumbling in his briefcase until he found the notes he had made while Ephraim watched him with increasing skepticism. Then came the few minutes when Robert asked questions about the legal points of the settlement and Ephraim's assistants responded by using the complicated jargon of corporate lawyers, while Ephraim himself looked bored and a bit exasperated by Robert's apparent clumsiness. Meanwhile, William and Victoria kept seeing each other, William with a kind and amused expression, and Victoria with a serious and curious expression, as if she wanted to read the intentions of William in his face and in his eyes, to read his soul. Victoria took advantage of a pause in the dialogue between the lawyers, to speak. Excuse me. I'd like to talk to you alone, Lord. William, Victoria said, her voice steady and serene. Of course, Victoria, we can go to a smaller room next door while our lawyers are still talking. And your friends can stay here or in the waiting room where they have drinks and a snack at their disposal," William replied pleasantly. Victoria's friends chose to go to the waiting room, where they were guided by Ernest, to Harriet's rejoicing and Nancy's shame. William led Victoria to a small room attached and opened the door inviting her to enter, and after Victoria entered, he entered behind her and closed the door. William invited her to sit at the head of a table rather smaller than the one in the boardroom, and he sat across from her. Victoria looked him in the eye, 
and she could not help feeling embarrassed by the look in his green eyes, but struggled to speak with seriousness and determination. Why do you do this? Why do you want to marry me? Obviously you're not in love with me. You could not, said Victoria trying not to sound aggressive or hard, but earnestly in her voice. Victoria, I know this is not normal, which is obviously crazy. But even if you cannot believe me, I swear I'm not crazy, my mental health is quite acceptable. Said William with a certain irony but with a sad smile, I understand that you are nervous or frightened, and that you distrust me and my intentions, I would in your place also. And obviously I cannot be in love with you and not because I could not fall in love with you, because any intelligent and tasteful man would be proud to love a woman like you. He added sincerely and seeing her intensely, that Victoria blushed and felt her skin prick up, but because we have known each other for a very short time. But life has taught me that sometimes love is not the best reason to marry, by saying this, William could not hide the moisture in his eyes and his face covered with a gesture of sadness, which made Victoria see him moved her, remembering what she read in the article on the internet, at this moment it costs me a lot, explaining to you my reasons, but what I can do is to swear that my intentions are honest and that I have no bad intentions. I just want to give you and your sister the opportunity to have a home and a stable family situation. I want to help you, and I want to get a chance to get to know you better, and maybe in the process we can both find some, comfort and joy," he finished. Victoria studied him carefully, intrigued. Do you understand that these reasons still seem insufficient? Victoria asked thoughtfully. I know, but that's all I can say for now. I hope that if you decide to accept my proposal, and as long as we know each other, I can open myself to you and you know me better, and hopefully you will get to understand me," William answered in an almost charming, very kind manner. William. I do not want to sound rude, ungrateful, or arrogant, I really am not like that. I am a young and inexperienced girl, and I am poor, but I have dignity. I am willing to do anything for my family but I need to leave one thing clear, although I would accept your proposal, I am not a merchandise, I am not for sale. I can be your wife if you want, for whatever reason, but I am not nor will I be an object of your property," said Victoria with the voice a little broken by emotion. I get it, Victoria. I would never aspire to buy a human being, and of course I could never see you as an object that can be bought with money. And you're honored to say that. I respect you more for it," William said sincerely. There is one more thing, William. I... I could not accept that you force me to have sex, if I do not want it," Victoria said in a broken voice and trembling a little but with a serious face. William made a serious gesture on his face, then softened it and smiled wryly. I do not know if you know, Victoria, but in this country as in most of the world, that a man compels his wife to have sex against her will, it's a crime equal to rape. A man can go to jail for that, but even if I were not, I would never rape a woman or pressure her to have sex with me against her will, and I would be offended if someone thought I would be able to do something like that," William replied with serenity and without losing the sarcastic smile. Excuse me, if I offended you, William. I just... Victoria said with a sincere apology. Victoria, I do not pretend to have a sex slave, and certainly do not pretend you to do anything you do not want. If we marry and you never want that marriage to include sexual life, it will be so, even if it lasts a few years. Of course in that case, I will have to seek satisfaction for my needs outside marriage," said William indifferently. Victoria was surprised to hear him and without knowing why she felt a certain disgust, as if that was something that annoyed her more than usual in her situation. And if I needed to find that satisfaction, could I? Victoria asked sarcastically and a little defiantly, betraying her displeasure. You could do it, I could not prevent it, but in that case if you did before we were five years of marriage and I would discovered it and could prove it, you would not get not even one pound in the divorce, replied William a little mockingly, but speaking with sincerity. Once again the subject of money as a conditioner, 
if I am faithful in marriage is because I really keep my promises and I'm not one. Victoria replied. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, let's not argue about it, let's talk about something useful. I have a proposal for you, an offer for your friends, said William kindly. For my friends. Victoria exclaimed in surprise. Yes. Victoria, if we are married and you come to live in my house, your sister will live with us and your mother will also live in our house when she is strong enough to leave the hospital. That's why I thought that to take care of your sister and to keep you company, so that you do not feel strange at first and so that you are accompanied, I could offer employment to your friends for working as nannies and assistants of yours for what you need. I am willing to pay a good salary to them, much better than the salary that they receives in their current jobs, William said quietly and pleasantly. Are you willing to hire my friends to keep me company and take care of my sister? Victoria asked, a little astonished. Yes, realistically, it will still be some time before you trust me. So it is normal that you feel insecure and perhaps scared living in my house, with your sister as the only person in the house you trust, but if your friends are with you, if there is always at least one of them in the house, I think you will feel safer and more comfortable. It is only right that you have your own staff of confidence and if you have to hire a pair of nannies, better be your friends, people who are like sisters for you. Of course, if you do agree, William replied convincingly. Victoria stared at him in surprise and enchanted her without being able to avoid feeling excited her because he cared so much about her comfort and safety. Well, of course I like the idea. I'll have to propose to them, though I think they'll agree. Victoria replied timidly. Very well. I also wanted to propose something else. My house is very large, and is built on a large property, and beside it I have another house a little smaller but almost as comfortable, for the guests. If you agree to get married, I would like your sister and you to go live immediately to that house, with your friends taking turns sleeping with you. Not only would it be practical for you to get used to what will be your residence, but also because it can strengthen our position in the meeting with the officials of safeguard that we will have to attend in a few days on the matter of custody of your sister, said William. Do you want me to move with you now? Victoria asked a little nervously. Well, not exactly with me, William replied with a smile and showing some embarrassment or shyness. As I said, the guest house is a little smaller than the big house, but it's still very spacious, and although them re in the same property, facing each other, them are two separate houses. I guarantee that you will have absolute privacy, but your sister and you would be very comfortable, and what is more important, if social workers come to carry out an inspection, we can give the image of a family nucleus already structured and stable. I mean, we live as a domestic partnership before we get married, Victoria said, blushing a little. Exactly. William said, amused and a little embarrassed. As I told you, your friends can go with you and start working right now. I can double their salary. You do not know how much they earn, Victoria said a little disconcertedly. It does not matter, replied William, not in vanity but rather sincere and a little anxious, and tomorrow we can begin to manage your mother's transfer to the private center of which I spoke to you, which has novel or experimental techniques. Victoria studied him again, trying to decipher the strange man, wondering to herself where the trap was, but realized that she had no options or excuses to refuse and inside her head she decided to leave everything in the hands of God or the fate. William, honestly you are the strangest man I have ever met. I accept to marry you, Victoria said almost solemnly and a little excitedly. Thank you, it is an honor for me. And I hope that in spite of this strange beginning, this wedding will be beneficial for both of us, one way or another. In any case, I am a lucky man to marry you, William said with voice deep and intense, as he took her hand and kissed her back, surprising her and making her blush and even tremble a little when she felt the touch of his lips with her skin. Then everything happened very quickly, both came out and announced their decision, receiving the congratulations of the lawyers. Ephraim's face reflected mixed feelings, but with concern predominating over others. Robert was happy, 
and more so after he received a check for services rendered to Victoria. Then Victoria went to the waiting room and communicated the decision to her friends, who gave her moral support, and then reacted with surprise to the job offer. But Vicky, it is firm that job offer? You know I need to work, Nancy said carefully. He assured me, and he said he was willing to pay you twice their present salary, Victoria said. The double. Harriet exclaimed in astonishment, making Victoria smile amused. Count on me, Nancy said at once. And with me. Vicky, I have a tantric sex book that I can lend you use with Lord William, and that's how you hook him, Harriet said, as if she meant it. Shut up! cried Victoria and Nancy, and then the three of them laughed. You're getting married. Nancy said to Victoria, as if she had just discovered it, in an excited voice. I am going to marry. Victoria replied, and then the three girls hugged each other in tears. The next day, in the morning, William arrived at him prison Bronzefield, entered jail and was escorted through all the security checks by a senior official. William's face reflected a lot of tension and disturbance as he walked down the corridors to access the department where the most dangerous prisoners were housed. William was taken to a prison room, where the prisoners were visited of their relatives. There was a glass partition separating the prisoners from the visitors, but for this occasion the only visitor was William, who waited impatiently and nervously. He walked along the long room to a corner, when he heard the person he was waiting for. He did not want to turn around to see her until he learned that the prison guards, two stout women, placed the person in her seat in front of the screen and then withdrew from the section of the room intended for the prisoners. It was a woman who looked about 40 years old, tall, barely a little shorter than William, with white skin and dark hair that was long to the shoulders. She was a beautiful woman, with a face of beautiful and elegant features, and fleshy lips. She had blue eyes. Over her simple clothes she could be seen to have large breasts and the silhouette of a beautiful body. Despite her natural beauty, there was something disturbing about that woman. In the hard gesture of her face there was a tormented soul, and she had the look of a person who suffers, and something else, much darker and indefinable. What do I do here? I do not get visitors, who's there? The woman asked angrily and nervously. William's hands trembled and he had to put them together to try to control the tremor. His face was pale and had a gesture that revealed contradictory emotions, anger, pain, hatred, and fear. He had to grit his teeth, take a breath and close his eyes, to try to control his emotions and face the old ghost, the devil. He turned and walked to the chair in front of the woman's place, separated by the screen. When she saw him, she opened her eyes and her expression expressed fear and surprise, and she stood up startled. William! exclaimed the woman, almost in a shout. Caroline, it's been a long time, William said with hatred, contempt, and pain in his voice and his gaze. They both looked into each other's eyes, through the glass, Caroline with a look of astonishment and fear, and William with a look of anger and hatred. He sat down and motioned for her to sit across from him, both separated by the bulkhead. I suppose you did not think you would see me again in life, would you, Caroline?" William said in a voice of barely controlled anger and deep scorn. "'What are you doing here?' cried Caroline in a voice broken by fear and emotional shock. "'I guess you did not think much of me in all this time, and I'm probably the last person you wanted to see in front of you, do you sleep well at night, Caroline?' said William with a sarcastic and cynical touch in his voice but with pain in the background. I do not want to see you. I want to go back to my cell!" cried Caroline, and went to her feet. You will not leave without hearing me, damn bitch! At least that, you owe me! cried William, with a fist punch in the table-like piece of furniture that was attached to the middle of the screen, while his face was distorted in a formidable gesture of murderous fury. Caroline stared at him with wide eyes and a look of fear and anguish on her face, she sat down again. Don't worry, my visit will be very brief. Said William recovering apparently the calm, anyway I do not want to be long in front of you. 
I just came to share with you a happy news. Happy news? Caroline asked in bewilderment. Yes. I have the pleasure of informing you that I am getting married, replied William indifferently. Caroline opened her mouth and looked very surprised, but after a moment her face distorted into a mockery and began to laugh in an unpleasant way, surprising William a little. You have come here to tell me a lie to torment me, cried Caroline with a laugh. What makes you think it's a lie? William asked coldly. You cannot be happy again. Not after what happened, Caroline replied, and as she uttered the last words she stopped laughing, her expression turned somber and her gaze turned sinister. William paled, his body trembling with a shiver, and his eyes grew wet, but he gathered strength and calm. You're right, Caroline, you took away a very important part of my life, and with that you ensured that my happiness can never be full again, for the rest of my life. But that does not mean, that I cannot find something of peace and happiness, that I cannot rebuild my life. And I have found the ideal person to do it. Caroline saw him with disbelief and serious face. She's young, very young, she's actually young enough to be my daughter or even your daughter, although she was lucky not to have been born from the belly of a bitch like you. William said with a wry smile, hard gesture on the face, she is very beautiful, with a natural and childlike beauty, but what no does not stop being very hot, is not a model as you were, does not have a sculptural and voluptuous body, in fact her is thin and of low stature, but her sensuality is wilder and irresistible to me than yours. She is intelligent and brave, she is hard-working and honest, she is noble and generous, the things you could never be in life. She is strong and independent, and although she comes from a poor family, she is a proud woman, but not arrogant like you. She loves her family, and would do anything for it, any sacrifice, while you, well, we know what you would do with your family." Caroline shuddered to see the way William saw her when he uttered those words, almost certain that if there was no a screen between both, he would have killed her at that moment. But what I like most about her is that she is pure and innocent, her soul is not yet polluted by the wickedness of the world. She is innocent in a special way, because she is not stupid and knows how cruel this life can be, but she is pure because her feelings are guided by generosity and love. And that beautiful and extraordinary young woman is mine, yesterday she agreed to marry me. She accepted to marry and I know that her intentions are not dark or perverse, as I would have suspected in any other woman after the damage you did to me, and I know them are not, because this time I was the one who played dirty, it was me the one who manipulated it or deceived her to some extent, because I needed it to be mine. Do you know why I needed it? Caroline was looking at him now, with an uneasiness, as the woman's breathing quickened. Because I have understood that my best revenge against you, is to make you see me happy, that you see that you failed and you could not destroy my life. Because I'm going to make that girl fall in love with me, I'm going to make her love me, and although it's almost impossible for me to love a woman after what you did to me, I'll make an effort to get it or at least to be the best husband for her. I'm going to build a new family with her, I'll fill her with children, and I'll make her take your place in every way, live where she was your house, sleep where she was your bed, and be under my body as you were. And we will raise our children together, she will hold in her arms our children, and I will feel that feeling that you took to me. And every day that passes, you will know that I'm sleeping with her, that I'm in bed making love to her, while you spend the rest of your life in this dirty hole. That will be my revenge, that you know that I have found peace and happiness, while you live in hell, so I will do justice to my son," concluded William with an intense anger. You cannot do it. I will not allow it, son of a bitch. Caroline shouted, slamming her fist into the wall with uncontainable fury. And how do you intend to avoid it, my dear? William mocked her with contempt. Damn you, William! cried Caroline wrathfully, but then her face covered itself with a twisted and perverse gesture of wickedness. Do you know that he called you? Do you know that he begged you to come and save him? William's face became like that of a person facing the greatest fear and the greatest pain in the world, pale and emaciated, 
while his whole body trembled. Shut up! William said in a broken voice. You must have heard him, William, he cried and shouted at you. Papa! Papa! said Caroline in an evil and mocking manner. Shut the fuck up! shouted William, getting to his feet. As he was writhes and struggles, as he clings to life, he screams calling his father, calling you, William. Calling you to come to save him, but you did not come, you could not save him, until his last breath, when life died in his eyes, said Caroline and laughed. William took the chair and threw it against the reinforced glass of the screen, which did not break but was covered it with thunderbolts, damaged it. William threw himself against the glass and punched it while he screamed hysterically. I'm going to kill you, bitch. I'm going to kill you. Shouted William. Caroline had risen to her feet and backed up a few steps, but she laughed hysterically. You'll never be happy, William. Never. Caroline yelled as she laughed hysterically, and William kept punching the screen in a futile effort. Two male guards entered the section where William stood and they held him by the arms as he twisted. There was also an official dressed in a suit and tie. Please, Lord Mayborn. Please, you control yourself," said the official in suit and tie. Meanwhile the female guards, the two sturdy women, entered the section where Caroline was and they held her by the arms, as she struggled with them. Let me go horse. Let me go. I will never let you be happy, William. Never. Caroline shouted as they pulled her out of the room. While the terrible scene ended in prison, far away, in her apartment, Victoria walked barefoot and in clothes to go by house from the kitchen to the table, and sat down with a glass of orange juice in her hand. She searched on her mobile phone, on the internet, and reread the headline of the article she read with her friends. Lord Mayborn's wife, Lady Caroline, arrested for the brutal murder of the couple's son. Victoria closed her eyes and sighed.